would normally pop up. It does. That's probably what you would do, is switch the two screens. Yeah, no. Screen two. Okay, let's try that. What do you see? That's much better. And you see a Google Earth map, is it? Yay! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we do. I can see my house. Yep. We're good? Yeah. We're sucking diesel, Jack. This is it. Oh, thanks for God. <laughs> right. Thanks, Pat. Okay, Thank guys you, Pat. and girls, uh, my humblest apologies. Um, this, despite our best efforts. Look, that just means I have to speak even more quickly than I had proposed. Right. So this is very much a fringe event um, as far as the Heritage Week is concerned. We are talking about the fringes of Cork Harbour. Now Cork uh, Harbour has always seemed to me to be a bit like a womb with a baby therein. We have the two ovaries there at Middleton and Cork and uh, it's, the harbour is enclosed by this, um, uh, by the uh, sheltering hills and um, the villages and communities around it. So it's very much a home place and a very comfortable place. And it has been for many years. Now, uh, basically humanity has not been looking after Cork Harbour, so it has deteriorated from an environmental point of view. Um, and is now beginning to recover uh, with the change in agricultural practices and with um, uh, the Urban Wastewater Directive. So we're going to be talking about the marginal areas and you see these are the um, particular um, channels and um, trails that I want to talk to you about. Now I'm not a historian, I'm a jack of all trades and I just like to talk about things that I enjoy and I like even more seeing other people enjoy them. So we're going to explore these um, different uh, streams and channels, the Onabui, Loch Beg, Douglas River, up the Glashaboy to Glanmire, we'll go around the Slatty River, we'll go, go between Belvelli, Bel up to Balnacurra, and then we look at the stretch between um, Saline and Whitegate. We'll be looking at these channels from the point of view of navigation in there in small boats. We'll be looking at them uh, from an environmental flora and fauna point of view and talking a little bit about what we know about the carrying on uh, of the population in Cork Harbour in um, historical times. Now, um, there's a couple of references that I, if people want to follow my footsteps in and around these channels, uh, there are a couple of things that you should look at beforehand. Um, the guidance for leisure craft on the Port of Cork. Now, Port of Cork is primarily a commercial port, and this guidance note um, document is available from the Port of Cork website and within that uh, you can see a very clear demonstration and explanation of why you need to take cognizance that it is the Port of Cork. The most dangerous traffic on the, on the um, port to my point of view is the pilot boat and particularly for kayakers and stand-up paddle boarders. You can't really see this guy so well, but you can see by his body language the amount of care and concern that he has for the smaller boats that are around him. These boats, they generate a huge wash, and basically, if you see them coming, hold tight, because you, they have a mission, and don't expect them to slow down and stop for, on your behalf. Uh, the second is the safe operation of recreational craft. This is probably the best manual that was ever written and it's produced by the Department of the Marine. There's a chapter on it on uh, kayaks, there's a chapter on rowing boats, etc. And I do uh, recommend that you down this, download this 
from the Department of the Marine, just do a, a search for a code of practice for safe operation and it'll come up there. If you adhere to that, then if you do get into a little bit of trouble, then you have a, a very good uh, defense. Other things that I strongly recommend as tools are the tide tables. Um, Kieran McCarthy's book, The Little Book of Cork Harbour, this is where uh, most of the uh, gems that I want to draw your attention to today come up with. And the other is Navionics. And I recommend that you subscribe to Navionics. Uh, I don't think they're going to be short of money, but the extra little bits that you do get, uh, the community information, etc., is all um, it's, it's very useful for people who want to go around in small channels. Uh, the other aspect that I use is Google Earth and uh, Google Earth for the type of uh, voting activity that we'll be talking about is probably the best charting package. So uh, this here is the Navionics with the, with the Bing equivalent of Google Earth uh, drawn in. And um, what it actually shows you, you can see where the uh, channel through the mud actually is. And we recommend that people who want to make a voyage that before going out, the night before, that you take your avionics or whatever GPS package you have, and you put in a couple of waypoints. Um, in this case here, which is the Onabui, which is the first river we'll be talking about, you would put in, say, a waypoint here. At this point here, you know that you've got to turn and go towards the church. And then when you come to here, uh, another waypoint, and then you know that you want to come down and just miss this boat yard. Having those waypoints um, means that you're a little bit less likely to do as has been done many times, and that is get stuck on this mud here. And also having the Navionics on your phone means that you can record a track as you move along, and that will be on the rising tide, uh, so that when you're coming out on the falling tide, you have a clear track which you can follow. Now, um, the Cork Harbour is in fact well equipped with services and uh, this is something I did earlier for uh, an, another exercise. There are lots of keys, lots of places to land um, and the rise of uh, kayaking and paddleboarding means that uh, this utility uh, this wonderful environment, this wonderful playground uh, will surely uh, become much more used. Most of the places that we'll be talking about tonight, you uh, very rarely see any traffic whatsoever in them. Now, um, with the rise of kayaking and uh, stand-up paddleboarding, the Corkham Navigation Facebook page, there is a um, um, an idea to use that Facebook page as an ad hoc uh, center for small craft outings so that uh, people don't tend to go out on their own. It's going to be a nice day on Friday. Let's uh, go somewhere. We'll meet at Black Rock and go up to Glenmire or something like that. That's the idea. Um, it's not a club. It's not an organization. It's not a business. No membership, no insurance. Just be sensible and come along and have a good time with other people who enjoy doing the same things as you do. So the, we'll start at uh, seven o'clock on the harbour and work around uh, clockwise. What you see here now is the Onabwee River. Here you have a cross haven, and, uh, which got its name from a cross that was erected by the uh, Normans when they landed here and it was across to St. John, so it became Cross John to Cross Own, then to Cross Haven. And in Irish, it is Buntarna, the um, bottom of the river. And uh, where's my mouse gone? Um, down here is a public slipway and there's car parking in front of the Bochard, uh, so you can leave your car there. It's an easy slip to launch at. Another launching place that is a possibility is across the river at Currabinny. 
Um, you can paddle up here through Drake's Pool. There's this is Rabbit Island here, and um, there's a parking place there and a little beach on which you can launch, and on up the river. And when you come to uh, this corner here. You just do need to avoid this sand, this mud bank. A number of people have got into trouble on it. When you reach this point here, you can see the price of the fuel on a fuel station, which is just here. As long as you can see the price, now you won't be able to read it, but as long as you can see it, you can just keep heading for that and you'll be close enough to the channel to um, get up into the narrow part where the navigation is much easier. Now, um, let's talk about um, Carrigaline and the Crosshaven River. Um, the Crosshaven, people associated with the Royal Cork Yacht Club and with yachting generally. It has a long tradition, as I say, it goes back to Norman times, uh, Temple Breedy and um, the uh, fortress at Canton were all an important part of the Crosshaven history. Now, I'm avoiding talking about anything that is in the main channel of the river, so I won't be dealing with the likes of Spike Island and the fortresses or Cove. These each are dealt with in uh, RTE nationwide programs, for instance. I'm dealing with the little backwaters that people may not know about. Now, um, the RCYC uh, is the progeny of the Cork Water Club, which we'll be talking about more later. And the Cork Water Club had an influence on uh, boat design and on uh, the evolution of boats uh, within Cork and then around the coast. Now, what we're looking at here, uh, on the top right, we have a house which was part of the 1903, 1903 uh, Cork exhibition. And this house was uh, floated down from Fitzgerald's Park and erected there. Um, the next photograph has a building which I think looks very much like a Coast Guard building. I'm not sure whether it is or not. You'll be amazed at the depth of my ignorance. Uh, you'll come to understand in the next 40 minutes or so. But principally, the impact of this building was that it became the summer residence of the Merchant Princes of Cork. And this uh, key that's in front of it was part of the steamship commuter uh, up to the city and also after the train came to Crosshaven, um, it would be the fashion to, for the uh, men heading off to work during the summer to go across, catch the train into Cork and um, do their day's work when, during the summertime. Uh, behind you have Currabinny Wood. And uh, next thing that we look at now is we look at uh, Drake's Pool. Um, Drake, the story about Drake hiding from the um, from the Spaniards uh, isn't well backed up in his logs, and doesn't to me make a huge amount of sense. Um, because if he could sail in there, uh, and the Spaniards did come in, he was basically screwed because he had no way out. Uh, also, whether the Spaniards would come in to uh, Cork on such a sortie. Uh, if they could sail in, they'd have a job tacking out. I'm not so sure that that would be good military operation. Now, Rabbit Island, you can land just at the northern tip in your kayak or small dinghy. And here there's a lovely park with benches. And also, if you want to launch your kayak here, there is a parking place here. There are barriers overhead. So uh, you don't want to be going in there in the camper van with the kayak on top. Um, the house here that's underneath is Newnham's house. And when we came to Cork, this house was occupied and quite busy. It was used to shoot the film version of Molly Keane's uh, Good Behaviour. 
and uh, it's a fine house of its style and its time, but unfortunately, I don't think its future is very bright. On the right here is the photograph that I took during the COVID when it was at the seven kilometers. I'm blessed in so far as I live by the water at Carrigaline, and so I, it was within my range to paddle in my kayak out there. Here we have Gorse and Blackdorn. Not a fantastic um, photograph, I'm afraid, but it'll give you an idea of the natural beauty that is to be found up along that shoreline. Coming back to Drake's Pools, across the road from Rabbit Island, there are uh, lime kilns, and just off the picture to the south uh, east is uh, the lime key and uh, that's where lime was loaded to um, uh, for delivery into Cork or wherever it was required. Now if we head on up the river to Carrigaline, uh, there is a landing place uh, but not a particularly good one at Carrigaline and uh, it's here underneath the old railway bridge. Uh, at high tide it's possible with the Carrick or a, a, a Rankin boat or something like that to step ashore. With a kayak you can uh, clamber out just here. We'll find that there's um, different types of landing places that I deal with. There's uh, climb out, step out and uh, scramble out. So this one here uh, is for a boat climb out, for a kayak it's a uh, scramble out. There's a nice little garden here beside, Lidl's just across the road. And it, this photograph here is uh, Le Beauvoir et Le Autre and uh, it's um, a nice um, a little place for sitting and enjoying the sunshine and across the road from it is one of the best pubs in Ireland, uh, the Gaelic. And just in the background here is the monument to the Collins brothers. Collins is a good Carrigaline name. And the Collins brothers uh, were one of many Irish people who uh, during the Victorian times found themselves uh, developing foreign navies and these guys were instructors for the Imperial Navy in Japan and the Imperial Navy were very very grateful to them and um, uh, in I can't remember what that monument was put up, but the, there was a Japanese representation there on occasion there have been Japanese uh, visitors. Uh, because, uh, as I say, these guys were much appreciated by the Japanese. Now on the bottom right there, you can, if the water level is less than 3.5 meters, it's possible to kayak or I've even done it myself in the rank and um, go underneath in the, in the dinghy. And it's very pretty for maybe about 200 meters up the river. Here again, we're in the springtime, driven out by COVID and uh, you know the trees and the um, kingfishers and the gray wagtails are numerous all around here. Amongst the bird life here are, are the swans. There's been a pair of swans in this area for a while and that guy there now is not saying look how pretty I am. Uh, he, he's saying look how big and dangerous I am and you and your damn kayak piss off away from my territory. The background to Carrigaline lies in pottery and um, the uh, clay used to be landed at the quay that you can see there in the top left hand picture. Uh, the other um, feature that's in Carrigaline that you can see when you step out of your kayak is the outfall from the mill race from Roberts's mill. Now, uh, Roberts's mill building still stands behind that outfall and a large proportion of the uh, mill race going back up to, uh, up to Ballinray Road is still uh, traceable. So the sluice uh, for the mill is at Sluice Cottage 
and you can see still the structures which are there for that. Um, Carrigaline proudly boasts two of the worst sculptures in Ireland, in my view. Uh, one is this here, which is meant to represent a, a boat, but in fact the rig is on backwards. The other one is in the roundabout outside the Catholic Church, and that um, is the greatest insult to a heron that ever was. However, I believe it was the same sculptor who did the very beautiful otter, which is there, so we'll say no more about that. And the next place I want to talk about is um, Lockbeg. And what we do is we come out uh, past Carabinia and around and into Lockbeg. And this is what Lockbeg looks like. Lockbeg has a very shallow entrance into it and it's somewhat industrialized, but it is an interesting past and um, for me is an interesting place, even though I haven't been there so much. Uh, so let's talk about the history of it. Um, Lockbeg has along this north shore here still some houses that were part of a shrimp fishing community. And um, these shrimp fishing boats, they were um, open boats and you can see the um, uh, dredge bar there behind that was towed behind the boats. And the way that they used to operate was that they used this um, scandalizing line here to control the power on the dredge. And uh, they would dredge for shrimps um, in Corkbeg and also uh, on other flat areas and a little bit more about that later. Um, from a natural point of view, the Cork Beg has a wonderful uh, wetland up in the north, um, in the northwest side, but you can approach it by coming down past the Moog factory. And uh, it's, but it is possible to get close to it with the kayak. I wouldn't risk it so much with the dinghy because it is rather shallow in there. But it does have a particular natural interest for me, and that is to do with shell duck. Um, shell duck have an interesting habit that around about this time or a little bit earlier in the year, most of the shell duck piss off to England to molt. And they leave one or two behind with a creche to look after the chicks. And while they're off molting in uh, usually the Firth of Fort or in the south of England, there's a few places where you might find a hundred thousand or more shell duck. These uh, pair here are teaching the chicks um, how to find the worms and how to get on with life. And I, I think nature is wonderful. Um, just outside uh, out just outside Corkbeg is this interesting beach. It is the beach behind what is now Thermo Fisher. And it's a great place for sex on the beach because the sand here is a little bit coarse. Uh, so the sand doesn't uh, blow into your drink. And uh, it's also a place where it's very little visited because as you can see, it's a very shallow approach. And so it's really a place for stand up paddle boarders and kayakers. Um, and also uh, the, the, the access to it is through the Thermo Fisher property. Now to get access to it from the land, you go to the security, you say that you're from the area They'll ask you, are you from the area? They don't specify how the, big the area is. And then you can walk through a lovely maintained wetland with bird hides and pieces, uh, posters with poetry on it from Yeats and others, and end up at this, uh, at this nice beach. It's probably one of the worst beaches in Ireland for sandcastles, but very nice for uh, relaxing on. Uh, if you want a bit of privacy and peace and quiet. There are no dogs allowed there. Uh, behind you, you see Carabini. 
Kurribini, meaning the mound of Bini. Bini was some sort of a, a, a monster or a warrior. Or, and up on top of that, uh, Kurribini, there's uh, a folly with a nice view all across to Crosshaven. And there's also a mound which was excavated with some amount of um, artifacts having been found. Now, at Corkbeg, there are two other beaches just inside. Uh, west of Hovion, there's this nice little beach which has a narrow walk down to it, perfectly good for sandcastles, but it's a shallow and somewhat muddy approach into it. And you can see behind that nice lady there, there's, uh, you can just make out where there's some boat storage and boats being maintained. On the outside is a beautiful beach uh, overlooked by Hovion and by the J&J &J um, medical Devices Company, can't remember what their current name is, but a lovely sandy beach and uh, just another way in which you can see just how blessed we are. Um, this beach, you, the lower sand on it is very walkable and uh, you'll find uh, clams, cockles, razor shells. And some years ago, I took a photograph of a ringed plover on that beach with her nest. And uh, her nest simply consisted of three eggs sitting on the stones. Um, but the beach is not so stony now, but the beach is a lot cleaner than it was at that time. The sand used to be a little bit black, uh, but the in application of the industrial emissions directive i think has sorted that one out so uh, let's leave lock Beg and we move around past spike and up, up towards douglas how are we doing my god it's 22 um so i said i wouldn't mention the uh central parts, but I do want to draw attention to Paddy's Point. I want to draw attention to it because it's a wonderful amenity uh, recently established by the Port of Cork. Car park, slipway, pontoon, and slap bang in the middle of all the action. So let's talk about the Douglas River. Um, the Douglas River uh, is um, probably a little bit uh, tricky. Um, I don't know why I say that. Uh, we've been in there with the corks a couple of times. I've been in there uh, with the kayak as well. Um, but it's a fantastic wildfowl reserve. So we do need to be a little bit sensitive about when we go there. Um, it's fascinating to go there now and through until, say, February. Um, particularly in February, uh, you find there's large flocks of uh, golden plovers who perform great aerobatics. On the bottom right, we have Hop Island, which used to be called Red Island until a Huguenot refugee came from Holland and he bought the island and um, with his what was left of his fortune and he set up a dancing school there and because the dancing school was such a success and so popular it became known by the local wags as Hop Island and is so to this day. You come in past Jacob's Island where there are steps where you can go ashore and on occasion there has been a coffee van near there. I have to say that I like to know where the coffee stops are. I enjoy that. And just across uh, here there's a place uh, where you can park and launch your kayak if you want to explore this region. So you can come around this bridge here, can have a strong flow on it, um, you know, in, with the extreme of tides. Very carefully head for this house here. Don't take a shortcut straight across. And again, anyway, you'll have your waypoints marked up. There is a wall here, which is quite narrow. I've always worried about it, and maybe that's why I've never had any bother from it. And then after that, you're into what is the nature reserve of 
uh, Douglas Estuary. And you can, on higher tides, land on these little islands, and we'll show you about that. And then we're up towards Douglas. Now, Douglas was quite a commercial place, and it made its money um, from sailcloth production. And in 1720, or 1750, there were 100 looms operating in the Douglas uh, sailcloth mills. And um, this territory here, uh, just north of us, is the territory of where William Crawford, who set up Beamish and Crawford, uh, and had their estates and lands. Now, in 1863, uh, there was established a rope works uh, by Wallace and Pollock in Douglas. And this was the way of putting the money into the pockets of the citizens. Uh, uh, so there is a derelict key here. And um, I made the mistake of landing on it with the Corrocks uh, two years ago. It's really unsafe. Uh, but there is a small beach here where you could land with a kayak. Um, so let's have a closer look at Douglas Estuary. You can see here a group of Carrickers relaxing and admiring the um, uh, murmurations of the golden plovers on that particular day. Now, in Douglas Estuary, along the north side of Douglas Estuary, near the railway line, there is an area to where I have seen a wide range of ducks, mergansers, tufted ducks, um, and uh, various others that I can't immediately bring to mind. Uh, the most common ones, though, are the waders. Um, here we've a good batch of black-tailed godwits having just arrived uh, from their migration. Uh, one caution about uh, Douglas Estuary is that it's very nice to row up and uh, enter in right close beside the um, highway there, beside the, the main ring road, which can be a little bit noisy, but there's a lot of nature there and lots to see and do. But be careful, uh, don't be tempted to enter into any of these culverts. This can be quite a dangerous thing to do uh, because the culverts very often do not have breathable air in them. If there's anything that has been rotting there, you're going to be in trouble. So let's move on now. Uh, we'll move around the corner and up and we'll have a look at the Glashaboy River. The Glashaboy. Douglas means the uh, dark stream and Glashaboy uh, means the yellow stream. So the Glashaboy River leads up to Glanmire and it's a nice handy little excursion. Um, this now is the Navionics and uh, the Navionics has been marked up by some uh, community members. And at the entrance, uh, to the Glashaboy River. You can see here there's a tidal retaining wall. So if you're coming in in a, um, in a dinghy or anything like that, you want to stick to the west. And in a kayak, now you'll see the weed like uh, indicating where this wall is. Uh, this bridge here uh, is the, uh, it's the N25 bridge and uh, this bridge uh, invert on it is 4.6 meters. So if you have a 3.6 meter tide, you can quite handily get up to uh, Glanmire. Now, the bridge has a slope on it um, and the side to go under again is the west side. The railway bridge, which is here, has a couple of spikes of metal sticking out from the wall. These are about 30 centimeters long. Uh, so uh, don't be going too close to the edge of the wall. One of these days I'll get up there with the hacksaw. You come along here past the beautiful house, which is a boat shed, which is used as a garage. And then you stick to the west and then you cross over because there's a retaining wall here. And this retaining wall uh, directs the channel. Now, one of the features of this channel is that there are three, three trunks and uh, branches, but they are mostly on the mud uh, along this area here. So once you get into the stream up by the retaining wall, you stick 
take on the beautiful west side uh, under the Vienna Woods Hotel and you come up to the quay. So let's have a look at the quay. Um, here we have the remains of the old quay and these quay houses. You can land here. It's uh, halfway between climbing and scrambling to get out. Um, it's possible to get a foothold from a kayak and walk out and there are some remains of bollards and some remains of the old quay and you can walk past the buildings out onto the street and then up to the garage which is about 50 meters away and have your coffee or in normal times across the road to the pub whatever suits you. I like this trip in particular because it's very atmospheric up here and um, you know Glanmire became a prosperous community based on the mills and um, they the, the milling here uh, uh, provided a bit of prosperity and eventually ended up uh, with Punch and Company who are still operating they're operating on Little Island now um, but they make waxes and shoe treatments and things like that. But uh, the old Punch and Company mill building is still there. It's out of reach of Kirk's, but I don't think it's out of reach of kayaks. Um, so we'll have a look back at the channel uh, there. It's a particularly beautiful channel. It's tree lined on each side. And here we're looking from the Glanmire end. You can just see the top of the wall where it goes across the river and then follows its way down. I have put markers on this wall, but um, with uh, timber and um, flotsam being carried down it's very difficult to keep the markers there so I think that <clears throat> having the Navionics waypoints is the modern solution and probably the best solution for mucking about uh, ditch crawling. Um, we'll just have a look at this is a photograph taken from the bridge it's really the head of navigation by anything very pretty and uh, the Punch and Company mill is just on our left there. So now we we'll move on to the Slatty Water and um, uh, the Slatty Water, uh, I'll include Glanton in this. Um, so you can see here that uh, we're coming down around by the tip of the southern part of Little Island, that's Carrie Grennan. And uh, we come up past the western tip of Fota. And we can go under the bridge, which as long as you don't have a mast up, you can get in at any time. And again, as you see here, the Google Earth points out exactly where the channel is. So what have we got here? Uh, on the way, we have uh, Carrie Grennan, which is a place I like to stop. Uh, this key is installed here because the deep water is actually quite close to Little Island at this point. Uh, unfortunately, there's a huge amount of rubbish um, still here. It gets blown up by the prevailing westerly winds. There's lots of plastic and uh, such things, but it's still a nice place to stop have the picnic and chill out and occasionally, dare I say it, there can sometimes be an odour from the adjacent sewage treatment plant. But if you don't tell your guests that there's one there, then that's okay. So we go in, um, slides I think might be a little out of order here. And yeah, but uh, uh, the purpose of this slide is to talk about uh, what is New Glanmire, also called Glanton. And this is a very pretty little community, which is where the um, Rising Tide restaurant is. Now, as far as I can see, the, the restaurant is open again, the Rising Tide restaurant. And um, at high water, plus or minus an hour and a half, you can land, you can come alongside here. There's barely just enough water. This water level here is 3.6 meters. And um, it's possible to climb up or uh, if you want to walk ashore on the other side of where the harbor is. 
Um, but they're very pretty houses and an old school there. And there's an interesting um, plaque there talking about how uh, Faulkner commissioned the um, uh, dredging and uh, the building of that little quay. Now, it's New Glanmire because they moved the port operations from Glanmire because of silting up. Now, out of the frying pan into the fire because this area is completely silted. And one must ask really where all the silt was coming from, if it was okay to build a key there in uh, the mid 1700s. Now, of course, the railway line and the highway go across between this area and the main part of the harbour. So uh, we'll go down now and we'll look a bit at Fota. Um, and at the western tip of Fota, you can see there there's some kayakers heading ashore to explore the folly, which is now, I suppose, Chinese owned. But it's a fine uh, bit of masonry, it's a bit of stonework. And um, this was uh, the construction for, of course, the entertainment of the guests of the local landlord. Um, the local landlord there also had his own key. And uh, this is a particularly excellent harbour. I um, This uh, family were involved with the uh, Cork Water Club. So I imagine that the key was used for the yacht as much as it may have been for any commercial purposes. But it's a fine key with steps down to the end, which suggests that it was more used for pleasure boats than for unloading or loading cargoes. Um, as you can see, there's no limit to my ignorance. Um, now, you can see in the background here, uh, there's a kayakers. I am fascinated that one of the things that COVID has done is it has done great business for the kayak sales and I'm glad also to see that we meet kayakers more often. Up to very recently you would hardly ever see um, uh, kayakers out in the harbour. Now it's almost like the seals, you hardly get out on a day when you don't see them. And that's wonderful. I draw your attention to this fine riveted bridge. Um, it's an excellent example. And uh, just behind that riveted bridge, there's uh, a quarry. This quarry was, uh, um, it, it's a, a grand place if you want to uh, camp overnight. Uh, there's, it's quite easy to get ashore and you can go around the corner from this quarry and make an illegal landing on uh, Harty's Island and uh, we did this uh, a few weeks ago and uh, it was uh, come ashore there amongst all the plastic and then clamber up onto what's the foundation for the next bird hide on the excellent nature reserve that Cork County Council are establishing there. And again, you know, this is all very fine doing this in August to February, but let's not do it uh, during the nesting season. This guy here, um, this uh, float, is an amazing item. It's on the north shore of the Slatty Water and um, if you look at it closely you will see that it's actually a sculpture carved out of limestone. It's an amazing work in my view. Um, it's perfectly rounded in, and in proportion to the shape and uh, the finish, the rivets, the bolts, everything, I think it's a wonderful thing. And I imagine that it was uh, part funded by the European as a sculpture for the uh, nearby road to Waterford and Rosslare. But it's positioned here where nobody can see it and enjoy it and appreciate it. There's no acknowledgement on it to the sculptures or to the craftsmen, whichever you may like. I can only conclude that the um, council thought that it was some sort of a joke. Um, but it's a terrible tragedy that we should have such a wonderful example of the 
uh, sculptures art um, concealed away like that. It's even, it's almost impossible to get to it from the road and it's quite difficult to get to it even from a kayak. Um, then we carry on up the Slatty Water to the viaduct uh, between the main road and uh, Fota and there's uh, gabions here where you can tie up your boat or at the very end there you can pull up your kayak. Uh, it's even a kayak launching place because there's space there and across the road you can treat yourself to sweet cakes and coffee in the Bramley restaurant. And then we turn around and we head around to uh, in, in towards Belvelli. And this tower here, uh, this is Manning's uh, tower, the Martello Tower, and it's, it's a unique tower in one particular way. It's the only tower of all the Martello Towers in the UK and Ireland that ever saw military combat. Um, in the 26th of September, of December, that's Stephen's Day, um, in 1867, uh, the Captain Mackey raided this tower and uh, the two gunners and their families were inside, I suppose, resting after the celebrations and they hadn't brought up the ladder and uh, so Captain Mackey got away with a load of gunpowder, car, uh, cartridges and a couple of carbines, um, which was bad news for the uh, opposition to the Fenians. And uh, the uh, two gunners that were um, assigned to the tower um, where each uh, the senior gunner, gunner was jailed, and uh, then uh, I understand that the junior gunner was transported, but uh, certainly he, uh, he there was the end of his career in the army. And not long after that, they decided to remove the guns from the towers because they decided that those towers were as much a liability as. Uh, as a benefit. Um, there are five Martello Towers around Cork Harbour and um, we'll talk a little bit more now about some of them but I'll stay focused on uh, our our subject. Now we're going to talk about Bell Valley and the uh, area north of Cove. Um, from a navigation point of view the um, balanced tide, uh, in other words, the tide coming up through passage comes up and ends here. The tide coming up through East Ferry comes up and ends here. If the wind is blowing from the west, you'd get a flow here to the west and conversely from the east. Now, um, Bell Valley um, is uh, so. Uh, I should say that once you have your navigation through here, you want to do it at about half tide or a little bit more than half tide in order to make it across this shallow point. If you're doing that, then you can see the channel on either side and it's possible to get through. But remember to record your track so that if you need to come back and it's a falling tide, uh, that you'll be able to uh, not get lost. So, um, uh, Belvelli Bridge was built around about the same time as the uh, Martello Towers, that's in the first decades of the 1800s, and it first joined the Great Island to the rest of Ireland. Um, there's Hotnet's Tower House, that's a Norman house, and that was beautifully restored recently and quite accurately restored um, at the cost of some five million, uh, five million sterling, I think it was. Uh, so it was a, a big investment and uh, it was restored in a manner that the, hopefully that tower will be retained. The picture here is the uh, Martello 
tower, uh, which is just at the end of the bridge. And of course, this Martello Tower would have been um, there to defend the bridge. Now, this Martello Tower did see some action, but it wasn't actually military action. But on the 9th of April, 1868, the sentry on duty heard some men approach the tower. And he called them and he got no reply. And the next thing was, there was a barrage of stones and uh, glass was broken. The crew, the gun crew uh, in the tower uh, knew of what had happened around the corner uh, in, by way of the Fenians, and they got into a panic. So they fired four shots from the cannon to get help, and the... Uh, soldiers and police arrived uh, from Queenstown, as it was. Uh, would it have Queenstown then? No, it wouldn't, because Queen Elizabeth, uh, Queen Ruin Cove, because uh, Queen Victoria hadn't arrived there. So when the troops arrived, they found two off-duty gunners from the tower unconscious on the ground outside the tower. They were completely drunk and had been throwing the stones to try and signal to their comrades to get access. Uh, so the two gunners who, who were James Dunn and Thomas Carson, they were court-martialed and jailed for their uh, troubles. Um, if we move along then to Balnacarra and East Ferry, we ha have um, uh, Ross League Martello Tower. It's just here. And um, there was a ground floor entrance cut into that, and that tower is now in the care of Cork County Council, but I'm afraid it's, uh, I fear for it. Uh, there was a fatal accident with that tower where the owner was, the owner of the land was showing the tower to some guests and he fell down the well, 70 feet, uh, and obviously did not survive. Uh, there's a fine line kiln adjacent to that tower. Now, in the area, after you leave the Bell Valley Channel, you come down along here in your boat or your kayak. There are a number of keys here. There's one here. And along this road, there's a road along here, so it's very easy to get access to the water there. Um, but there are steel bar markers of the channel. But generally speaking, as you can see, it's quite wide for the sort of boats that we're talking about. It's not a problem. But do watch out for the oyster bed markers. If it's very high water, it could possibly um, sit on them. Then as we head up into Balnacurra, there are plastic can markers there to mark the channel, uh, so that's a real possibility. Now Balnacurra uh, is another, uh, yet another wonderful place and uh, it has a great history. Um, it's a progeny of the success of Middleton. You can see there on the left, there are some uh, grain stores that have been renovated. And uh, the architecture around this harbour now really is quite nice. Uh, but it's lacking, in, uh, it's lacking in a pontoon. Now, um, Middleton's success was because somebody had the great idea of building a big main market square. This led to trade, this led to people having storehouses, this led to the processing of grain, brewing, distilling, woolen mills, and uh, all of this uh, activity, commercial activity, needed a port. And so the port was built at Balnacurra. And um, in 1837, we had vessels of 300 tonnes coming up into Balnacurra, and uh, vessels like the Brook lands and the Kathleen and May. The Kathleen and May is in the Thames at the moment. Uh, they came up here to uh, collect grain and produce for export uh, even to Cork City uh, but also uh, across to England and um, various other places. They, were, they did the rounds there. Now, Balnacurra itself um, is worth the visit. 
On the top left here we have Jacko's Pub and uh, this is a must uh, when it becomes accessible again. Uh, go in there, leave yourself time to read the walls and to talk to the landlady. Um, her husband and her, her family were the harbour masters there and she has fabulous logs and records and memories uh, of Palmacara when it was um, uh, when it was a great commercial port. Um, Edward Bransfield, recently the monument has been erected to Edward Bransfield, who was the first to map and chart uh, the lands, uh, lands in Antarctica, Antarctica. Now, on the south side of Balnacara, um, there is a uh, Balnacara Harbour. There is a slipway, and you can walk past some apartments. You can launch your kayaks there, or you can um, come ashore in your dinghy. And in fact, I have many times tied up my drascom to the wall there and clambered over the fence. Um, in the previous um, picture, can I go back to it? Yeah, uh, just in front of these buildings here, there are steps. Um, but the gate is normally locked. You can go hop across the gate and onto the road and then around to Jacko's. Or pay respects to uh, Bransfield or do some shopping or whatever is your pleasure. There's also uh, nice wooded walks, gardens, graveyards, lots of interesting things to do. Now, um, next we'll move on down. We're coming out of Balnacara here. Where's my cursor? You see, we're coming down here. And uh, we are coming back into the harbour again. Uh, we're coming to this place here, which now is not particularly imposing, but it's an interesting place. This is at Cursey. And in bygone days, in the last century, Rath Cursey, which still has a nice place for launching your boat or your car, you see it there on the left, and space to park the car. It was a thriving fishing port. And uh, you see these boats here on the right, these are the Rathcursey hookers. And you might think that they look like Galway hookers. Well, they do. Uh, the main difference between them is, as you can see in the lower picture, they don't have the curved stem that the Galway hookers have. But these boats, they used to fish um, from Rathcursey over as far as Dungarvan and down and into West Cork. And there are some great stories about Rathcursey, where they also had uh, forehand salmon fishing boats. These were open boats, um, a little bit like the shrimp boats that we saw earlier, but they were particularly for netting salmon. And um, in 1830, uh, in January, uh, on January the 21st, the uh, Rathcursey hooker Mary set off and went around by Cove and into Monkstown and started dredging oysters. This did not go down well with the uh, honourable people of Monkstown and they um, got a couple of whaling boats, jumped into them and went off to put a stop to this activity. Uh, a pitched battle resulted. Um, there was plenty of weaponry and the guys from Rathcursey uh, held their own for a while, but then they could see that they were going to come out second best. And uh, so they hailed a neighbouring schooner and the captain of the schooner, believe it or not, uh, it was the Navarino, Ag agreed that they could come aboard, and of course the result was that the pitch battle just simply moved on to the Navarino. Eventually, the captain of the Navarino hailed the uh, navy ship, the Pearl, and the Marines came on board and uh, brought the uh, combatants to co uh, to Cove, I think it was, I presume it was to Cove, uh, for medical treatment. There were eyes lost, there were serious injuries and uh, jail terms lashed out for uh, breaking 
of the piece. Uh, another mysterious event was the voyage of the Paris. The Paris was a, uh, a hooker owned by Ronain and the Bishop of Ross, uh, who came from Middleton, uh, died and contrary to his wishes was buried uh, in Skull. Uh, because the people of Skull really were very fond of him and they didn't want to let him go. But one night there were strange lights noted uh, in the graveyard and um, at the same time Ronane found that his hooker was gone. And uh, the long and the short of it was that the explanation is that uh, a crew from the next world came and took the berry and went down, collected the bishop and brought him back to where he wanted to be. And uh, so nobody is answerable for it. Uh, if we move on down, we're passing some lovely architecture. This building here is across from East Ferry. And um, this, I believe, was owned by the Kelly family at one stage. These were German musicians. Uh, but it's lovely uh, along there. Um, I've seen deer in the woods there, and it's all very nice. And we come to East Ferry, a very popular place with the uh, sailors of Cove, uh, Crosshaven, and all about. And it, there's a fine key there where you can tie up your drascom and step ashore, or uh, there's a beach there where you can launch or step out of your kayak. Uh, there's also a restaurant, very nice uh, chowder, the tavern, um, muchly recommended. And uh, it's a beautiful place to sit in the afternoon sun. Uh, just heaven. Now East Ferry get its, got its name from a chain ferry that ran uh, there and thanks very much uh, Kieran McCarthy for getting me this photograph. Now the chain ferry, uh, chain ferries operate, um, I see them in Eastern Europe, I've seen them in Sweden and they're operating uh, today on a much bigger scale than this. Uh, in the Devon, Cornwall and along the south coast of England. There's one on Dartmouth. It's quite a big ferry. And the principle is that there's a chain that goes along the bottom and uh, this wheel here, uh, in this one it's operated by hand and what happens is that the chain comes up and across the boat and down and you move the boat across and back and it's an efficient way of doing it. In Eastern Europe we have seen them that they uh, run powered by the current. The operator presents the boat, uh, which is usually a twin catamaran pontoon, as is this one, and the current then sort of ferry glides the boat across. This one here you can see has a horse and cart on it. And uh, uh, it, it was operating there. And I read from Kieran's book that the permit for that is still kept live and uh, that's in itself is a wonderful thing. Now uh, we're looking here just to give a feel for what um, the East Ferry Channel is like. On the left we have the Holy Trinity Church and opposite is a um, lovely walkway and beach and if you look closely you'll see there's a couple there enjoying the day. There was a mass rock here and um, the uh, uh, the parishioners would be on the other side of the river. I suppose they had good hearing to hear the mass in, in that case. But that's a lovely place, strong currents, deep water and open to everybody. So we'll move along around. Uh, how are we doing? Quarter past nine. Ooh. Uh, and I, my apologies. I hope you're enjoying this because uh, we're well over time. Very quickly, uh, we'll look at uh, the East Ferry area now and uh, Saline Creek to Cork Beg. This is Saline Creek here. There's Bronze Age um, races on the North Shore and on the South Shore is the Rostellan House with, and grounds, which originally was uh, the Fitzgeralds. 
uh, were there and then later it became the haunt of Lord Inchiquin, who is of the O'Brien clan. And it was Lord Inchiquin who started off the Cork Boat Club. He, he and his gang, he acquired Holbolin. Um, it's a lovely run up to Saline Creek. And particularly in a kayak, you can go quite far up into this uh, wooded channel here. Uh, the Saline Creek has a dolmen in it. Some people accuse this of being a folly, but I say nonsense, outraged, uh, despite the fact that it's oriented the wrong direction and it's confirmed by the notice on the side of the road to the north of it that it's 6,000 years old. Uh, how dare people say that anything is false in Cork Harbour. Um, the, we'll move quickly around to Ahada, where there's plenty of parking space, grand slip for launching. And there's the Rosie's Pepperstock Bistro, again, for a nice chowder, nice place to relax on the, uh, on the sunny day. Um, Ahada had its heyday during the First World War. It's, um, is the one of its sons was Willie Cosgrove, the giant of Gallipoli, who was one of the few people to earn the Victoria Cross and live. Uh, that's another story referred to Kieran's book. And uh, during the First World War, it was the seaplane base. Now, it only became a seaplane base in uh, to. Uh, in 1918. You can see there one of the craft being retrieved and there were submarine spotters and as you can see from the installations down below there was uh, it was a hive of US Naval Navy Air Force activity stacks of testosterone going around for the estrogen on Cove and Cork City which caused some problems at the time. Uh, you can see there the, the, this slipway runway at Ahada Tennis Club. And just to the west of that is what looks like a road leading to nowhere. That in the First World War time had uh, a timber key off it and it was the landing place for the steamships uh, that ran the commuter service around Cork Harbour. Um, so now we'll move across and uh, we're at Whitegate and you see here where the oil tanks are. Uh, this is Corkbeck Island. That had a 50 room house on it uh, built by uh, Robert Penrose, uh, who was the Earl of Desmond and a fine fellow. Uh, he, uh, he was a Fitzgerald, if I remember rightly, but that um, house was demolished to make way for the oil storage tanks. Now, um, Whitegate isn't often visited. It's quite shallow entrance into it, but it's reasonably firm ground to walk on if you find you have to drag your kayak to or from the water. But it's an interesting and a pretty place to visit. Uh, it's well worth the diversion. Um, I show this here as I, I like this. It's the uh, monument to the war dead, First World War and Second World War, and the tricolor is flying proudly beside it. How we have progressed. There's a lovely church there, the Church of St. Michael and the Angels, I think it's called, beautiful. Many of the buildings in the village are listed in the heritage, in the archeological register um, as being um, important examples of the, um, uh, of, of the buildings of the time. Now, this is a stone carved, I, it looks like concrete, it's not, it's, it's carved stone fountain that uh, was erected, uh, put up, uh, paid for uh, by um, Penrose um, Fitzgerald and in 1873. And it's a fine example of the stone carving skills. I wonder if it's the same family who did the stone, um, Boy, that was there. Uh, Whitegate 
has all the facilities that you need and uh, usually it's one of these places that people just drive through and now uh, one last thing thank god they say one i one of my favorite places is spike island and there's such a nice view across from spike island and it doesn't exist anywhere else I think the sound is a little bit hard to hear there, Jack. Now, the Carillion, it's the only such Carillion in Ireland. And where is it? It's in Cork Harbour. Of course it is. Where else would it be? Okay. So, um, thank you very much, anybody who's left. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the talk. And if I have... Uh, made any mistakes or committed any omissions which i'm sure i have committed many uh, email me thank you very much thank you jack. there are people left very interesting jack thank you thanks to bill jack um that was really interesting lots and lots and lots of detail there um i love all your stories of personal experience and highlighting nature and all the birds um, I've been monitoring the Facebook page um, as well as the chat here and um, no questions, which is great. <laughs> Lots of good comments and compliments. Um, so I'm going to leave it at that. Um, we're 22 past nine, so we've gone over, but we've only lost a couple of people along the way. So I think you held the attention really well. <laughs> well, my apologies for being so long-winded. I really tried not to be. Um, but like a lot of things, it's like the uh, guests at a wedding. You really don't want to leave ever, anything out. It um, was all but, worth it. Mm. So um, thanks, everybody, and um, we'll see you again next time. Thank you. Thanks, Joya. Thanks, Joya. <laughs>